Hello and welcome uh, to, well, welcome to this time together and thank you for inviting me in your, in your places and your spaces and I pray and hope that today finds you blessed of God and, and um, standing strong and firm in your faith. And for those who might be um, hearing this, maybe the first time or a couple times, however long, it doesn't matter, who are yet to come uh, to a conviction and a decision for Christ, I thank you so much for being here as well. And you are welcome to be here like anybody else. And I thank you for taking the time. And um, for those of you who have been keeping track and following along, uh, we are now in, I think, our third, uh, third uh, message in the Galatians series uh, for freedom. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's been, uh, it has been just a blessing to be able to prepare and spend time in this wonderful letter to the Galatians um, penned by uh, the Apostle Paul so very long ago. And I think very relevant um, as, it w as it is in our situation today. So again, thank you for uh, inviting me into your places and uh, spaces. And as we continue, uh, why don't we hear from a fellow by the name of John Bloom. He is a staff writer for DesiringGod.com. You, you probably heard me introduce him to you before. Um, I like a lot of what he writes in his articles. And sometimes they are helpful in introducing the message. Anyways, he reminds us today, Bloom reminds us today, that we are faced all the time with the certainty, as he put it, quote, things fall apart. And when you think about that, when you ponder that, and you, and you look at the physical aspect of our creation, indeed, the law of entropy is alive and well. Just consider our bodies. Marvelously, tells, the Bible tells us, put together by God according to Psalm 139. Yet, as Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 20, like creation itself, our bodies have been subject to corruption. They are falling apart each and every day as we grow older because of the, uh, the sin when it entered the world, corrupted creation and our bodies as well. And Bloom, using, uh, as he calls, the cracks happening in his middle-aged body, he, as an example of the cracks that he has found in every church I've known, that would be a quote from him, he goes on and presents his view on three common types of division that can be found in the church. And to his credit, uh, after I read the article, to his credit, not everything uh, that he finds is necessarily from a negative point of view. Sometime, Bloom would suggest, divisive issues in the church create positive outcomes, and he has my wholehearted agreement here. Another gentleman by the name of Tom, uh, Tom Rayner, in a blog, speaking about his cultural uh, uh, place of living in the, in the United States, said this, quote, one of the greatest sicknesses in our churches in America is disunity. Frankly, I think we all could say to Rainer, if you live in Canada, if you're, if you're listening to this and you live in Canada, we could all say to him, don't forget about us here in Canada. And then Rainer asks, um, what are some of the key reasons for disunity in a church? And in his short blog, he presents 14 reasons that impact unity, at least from his perspective, in the local church. And I'm sure that list could have been much longer as I could probably build a longer one. All of us probably could. But I do want to share four that really stood out to me, thinking about my context, thinking about my experience in the church over the years. One, Rainer suggests lack of prayer. Lack of prayer, and that's bang on. For a church that does not pray together, does not stay together. And I don't mean like it, it splits, but all sorts of things can happen in in the unity of the church if we don't pray together as a church. Of course, prayer is indispensable in our personal relationship with God and in our families, but it is absolutely necessary uh, for church unity. Two, no church discipline. And, and Rainer's bang on again. Sadly, even if a church has a biblical process for church discipline in place, it's often only a theory Three, self-serving church members. 
Well, you know, Rainer's three for three here. When church members insist on getting their way from everything, from worship style to all the other things about the worship service, to the color of the carpet, and so much more, you are no longer in a biblical church that, it, that should be concerned more about others than self. It's all about me, myself, and I. And the fourth one, the last one for us today, is fear of confrontation. Well, Rainer's four for four, folks. So instead of facing difficult situations in the church, and maybe even in the culture around us, as it impacts the church, many would rather sweep the problems under the carpet. And you know, it's like that kid, or maybe you've done this as a kid, uh, who closes his eyes and plugs his ears and repeats over and over, la, 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 uh, hoping the situation will go away, the monster under the bed will disappear. The Apostle Paul said to the Galatian believers here in his letter, in chapter 6, verse 2, he said this, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, that'd be a really good thing to heed, for sure. Please turn your Bibles to the letter to the Galatians, chapter 2. We will be uh, reading together the first 14 verses. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And for those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me, God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. Verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to... The circumcised, let me repeat that, I think I kind of botched that one. Verse 7, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to be circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles, and they go to be circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, like a, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness that even before each and every one of us was born, you have set before us the gospel of Jesus Christ that will set us free, free from the bondage of sin and the punishment of sin. Free indeed we are for those who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior. Help us to remember that in these days, in our time, as Christians today are faced with many changing things in the culture, rapidly so, coming up, bumping up very aggressively against the truths of your word, O oh Lord. I pray that we would stand firm in that freedom, that we would not submit and conform ourselves to the pattern of the world's, the world's view of good and bad. I pray, God, that we would trust you for the courage to do this, to make our stand, not out of hatred, not out of violence, but out of love for every single person on this planet. May love be our motivation. 
And I pray, Lord, that you would help us understand these words today. Inform us, O Holy Spirit. Teach us, guide us, and help us to put it into practice as well. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we began our study of Galatians, we learned that false teachers, uh, called Judaizers, had come along to the churches that Paul and Barnabas had planted in Galatia, teaching what Paul called a different gospel. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 6. And in all appearances, it seems that some were buying into this different gospel, which Paul had already, in our text here in chapter 1, admittedly denied. adamantly denied that even one existed, for he said, not that there is another one, another gospel, that is. And one cannot escape what Paul thought of the false teachers and what he suggested they should do. He said to them, let them be accursed, again, chapter 1, verse 9. We also must remember that Paul has solidified from the very onset of this letter, verses 1 to 5, that his apostolic authority to minister and bring the gospel to the Gentiles was not from man, not through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, for the glory of God the Father. We know this to be true when we look to Luke's account of Paul's transformation from a persecutor of the church to an apostle of Jesus Christ sent to the Gentiles by Christ himself. We see this in Acts chapter 8 and 9. You can read that for your own selves. So then from chapters 1... Uh, verse 10 right here through to our text right to to, uh, verse 14 Paul gives his testimony and his defense for his apostolic ministry but more importantly the evidence that the gospel preached by Paul was the very same gospel preached by all the apostles of Christ at this time we also need to keep in mind that the false teachers going from church to church in Galatia, following up behind Paul, would need to try and discredit Paul in some way or form in order to sell their version of the gospel. And one way we have already suggested was that Paul had watered down his gospel in order to appeal to the Gentile Gentiles in Galatia. And of course we can easily refute this uh, suggestion as Paul himself had said to the Corinthians in his first letter that he would rather be eternally condemned so that his fellow Jews receive what he calls the truth of Christ in that letter or the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friends, Paul would never water down the gospel. It wasn't his to water down. So the text we have today gives us more than enough evidence that the accusations against Paul from the false teachers wasn't a watering down, per se, of the gospel, but that Paul taught a different gospel altogether than the apostles of Christ, like Peter and John. And Paul's account here in chapter 1 and 2 demonstrates how strongly he defended his gospel that he had received from Christ. We see from the moment of his conversion until our first verses here, verse here in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul, by his very own admission, was adamant that he had been directly commissioned by God to go to the Gentiles. He had not been commissioned and sent by the apostles. He had been sent by Christ, and he had been working independently since his conversion. Matter of fact, until the events that that transpire here in chapter 2, described for us right here, Paul had spent only 15 days in Jerusalem, and that was three years after his conversion And those 15 days were spent primarily with the Apostle Peter and a short time, it tells us, with James, the brother of Jesus. This fact alone should have been more than sufficient, my friends, to make the accusation accusation that Paul was teaching a different gospel fall flat on its back. Paul's gospel was not lacking at any point. No doubt this would be the argument from the false teachers. Paul's gospel needed to be topped up, so to speak. No, Paul's gospel was, as he said, given to him by revelation from God. And the Galatians would be wise to stay with Paul because Paul preached the true gospel of Christ. Well, as we dig a little bit deeper here in the text we have before us, we want to clarify who's who in the zoo. Who's who in the zoo here in our 14 verses? And this, you will see, is important as we move on. So let's start with uh, the Apostle Paul, who brought with him Barnabas and Titus. Now, 
As for Barnabas, we first encounter him in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 36 and 37. And there we are introduced to a person known as Joseph, who was a Levite from Cyprus, who had come to faith in Christ in the early days of the church in Jerusalem. And this Joseph, the Levite, sold a field he owned and gave the money to the apostles, to this fledging church in Jerusalem. And it was here that the apostles began to call him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And, and this speaks volumes to, the, to his character and the way he approached people as a follower of Christ. We know that it was Barnabas who becomes the conduit, the one who introduces Paul to the apostles in Acts chapter 9. So then, next along with Paul and Barnabas, uh, we are introduced to Titus. And Titus is, is mentioned for the very first time here in Galatians, in the New Testament. Titus was a Greek convert to Christ. And yes, the letter to Titus in the New Testament, written by Paul, is also addressed to the very same Titus of Galatians that we have here. And you'll also find reference to Titus in 2 Corinthians and 2 Timothy. So Paul, Paul, I say Paul, pardon me, Paul, Barnabas, and Titus make up the threesome that come to Jerusalem here in chapter 2. Next we have mentioned in verse 6 the, the false brothers. These would be the Judaizers. These would be those teaching that circumcision and observance of the Mosaic law was part and parcel of the gospel. It was a piece of the gospel. Then moving on to verse 9, we, we are introduced to, to James, the brother of Jesus, who was a, a respected leader in the Jerusalem church in the early days. And along with uh, James came uh, the apostles Peter and John. So when we take Galatians in context, along with Luke's account of Paul and his ministry in the book of Acts, we could come up with a, a numerous points of discussion plentiful of commentaries over the course of church history, up even to today, have been written about Paul and his ministry from pretty much every theological angle possible. But let's keep our biblical hats on tight and, and keep this one thing in mind. Paul was called by a revelation given to him by God the Son to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Here in our text, this very same Paul who received that revelation from Jesus Christ himself went to Jerusalem, according to verse 2, because of a revelation from God. Whatever was to transpire in Jerusalem was for Paul not his personal attempt to defend his own point of view. He wasn't going to Jerusalem for a conference of apostles. He wasn't going to sit around and drink a cappuccino and discuss church policy. Paul, just like everything you read about him in Acts after his transformation from persecutor to apostle, was moving always in obedience to God's direction and purpose. That was his heart. So the question we should ask with all that was happening at this juncture in the early Christian church was what was God up to by sending Paul to Jerusalem? What was God up to by sending Paul, Barnabas, and Titus to Jerusalem? Just look at the count. Think about what we have here in these 14 verses. And we can say right off the top that God had never intended to build a Jewish-only church. Got to remember that the Jews were his people, his beloved people. But he never intended to build a Jewish-only church. Nowhere in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, we find any verse stating such a thing. God's covenant to Abraham was intended to bless all people. Listen to what Matthew said about Jesus in the very first verse of Matthew chapter 1, that Jesus was the son of Abraham. Remember the controversy that was happening in the Galatian churches? Judaizers were going around saying that all male Gentile believers must be circumcised. All male believers must be circumcised. They would argue that this, that this was what the, was taught by the apostles in Jerusalem. And maybe at some point they were practicing that still. But this is going to change. And without any time to explain, the apostles never taught that in order to be saved, in order to receive salvation, one needed to be circumcised, even if they were Jewish. 
apostles. Back to our question. What was God up to here in our text? And may I suggest that at this point of the early church, what transpired in Jerusalem with Paul and the other apostles was a turning point, was a hinge point in the history of the Christian church. Through Paul, God was moving far beyond Jerusalem. The gospel, my friends, of Jesus Christ doesn't belong to one race, one people, one color of skin. It belongs to the whole world. Let us not forget what John, the Apostle John, said in John 3.16, For God so loved the what? The world that he gave his only son, that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Secondly, we know by the context of Paul's letters that his number one concern, his draw, his, he was driven by this, was to do the will of God over all other things. When we look at the events before us, God gave Paul a revelation of what the church would look like beyond Jerusalem. And friends, Paul was going to obey God. He was going to obey God with all his strength. But we also see here that he was going to obey God and at the same time address what was near and dear to him, the unity of the church as well. Paul was not only laser focused concerning the gospel and preserving the true gospel, he was also, also adamant in, pre in preserving the unity of the church. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. Think about it this way. Paul brings Barnabas, a Jewish Christian, and Titus, a Greek Christian, who was not circumcised, to Jerusalem. Friends, here in living color was what Paul would say later here, say later, pardon me, would say later in his letter in chapter 3, verse 28, Paul said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Friends, today many are using this text to... to, to to explain the roles in a church. It's not about roles. This is about salvation in Christ. In Christ, there are no Jews or Gentiles or male or female or whatever. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And this is exactly what God intended with his covenant with Abraham. If we understand the Bible at all, we should understand this, where Paul said in his very next breath, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. My friends, the gospel is not a set of rules. It is the promise of God unto salvation for the Jew and the Greek, Romans 1.16. So for 14 years, Paul had been preaching his gospel. And right behind him, must have been so aggravating, Judaizers were preaching a gospel of Jesus plus, 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 plus. Man, do we see that in our current evangelical culture today. Many preaching Jesus plus, 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 plus. And Paul, even in our text, is clear. We see how clear he is there to always keep a boundary between him and the other apostle when it came to his apostolic authority to preach the gospel. He no doubt respected the apostles, but he would not show any partiality, for he said here in verse 6, what they were, those were the apostles, makes no difference to me. Why? Because he said, God shows no partiality. And of course, here he is, Paul, going to Jerusalem. And I believe he, he was taking a great risk to go to Jerusalem. But he went anyways, not out of doubt that his gospel was lacking anything, but for a very good reason. He tells us in verse 2, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. In other words, Paul went to Jerusalem, as the IVP commentary put it so well, to have his gospel evaluated. You see, here's the heart of this apostle. As uh, adamant and as strong he was in the, in the gospel that he preached, he knew that he was not above accountability. He was not above being evaluated. 
And this makes me want to pause for a moment and say to you that there are many, not some, I said some here in my notes, but there are many in positions of spiritual leadership today and in the past that believe that their preaching and their teaching was never to be open to questions or debate. And if you are in my... If you are in the hearing of my voice in such a place, in such a church, can I suggest you avoid them and run away as fast as you can? But I, I have digressed. So why don't we summarize verse 1 to 10 by asking this question. This is so important. That's coming out of this text. What Paul was so adamant about as well. What ties every believer together in unity? If you could boil it down, and, we, and you need to do this now, you need to boil this down into one thing. What is the one thing that every believer in the whole world today, in the whole world, has in common? Set aside the traditions. Set aside some of those other things that we argue on so often. It's the gospel, my dear friends. Men and women, brothers and sisters, this is God's purpose and plan from eternity past. To unite all of us with His Son, Jesus Christ. To unite all believers in His Son and Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that when you become a Christian, when you surrender your life, you repent of your sins, you turn to God and you surrender your life, you are in union with Christ. This, that's, a, that's a fact, Jack. This is what ties all of us together that call ourselves Christians. At this exact place in Jerusalem, in God's own time and purpose, the one true gospel had been entrusted to Paul to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. For God worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, for God worked also through Paul to the Gentiles, verse 7 and 8 of our text. And at the end of this day in Jerusalem, they all shook hands, united by the very same gospel. And then we have verse 11 to 14. You know, one of the things I love about the Bible, and this has been proved to me time and time again in my life as I lived my life in this world, how outstanding the Bible is, how God deals with people in real history, with real issues. And he brings in his spirit and he brings in his, his purposes and plans, his healing, his, his love, his kindness, his justice. So here we have 11 to 14, we have a confrontation. And God is, my friends, in the middle of all this. Here is a confrontation in the first century church by two giants of the church at that time, Paul and Peter. If you remember, at the beginning it was mentioned by Rainer that the fear of confrontation is one of the causes of disunity in the church. That those who sweep problems on the raw, a rug rather than deal with them do no service to the cause of the gospel. Well, verse 12 tells us that Peter, while in Antioch, would enjoy a meal from time to time with the Gentiles as well with the Jews. Matter of fact, he'd been doing this since his, his uh, vision from God in uh, Acts chapter 10. And then it tells us that, that, that this was the habit of uh, Peter in Antioch until certain men came from Jerusalem. And the text tells us that Peter drew back and separated himself. Why? because he was fearing the circumcision party, verse 12. And by the way, this leader's uh, actions had a ripple effect, for we read that the rest of the Jews acting hypocritically along with him. Verse 13, And even Paul's partner in ministry, the one that went with him on that first missionary journey to the Gentiles, no doubt eating with them, Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Verse 13, well, fast forward to today, different time, different culture, different issues, but it's the same gospel. More than ever, it seems, at least, it seems that there is social pressure today to accept and participate in practices that are condemned by the Bible. 
to celebrate what culture celebrates, not just accept, but celebrate, thus denying the commands of the Bible, denying the teachings regarding what is sin and what is not sin against a holy and just and perfect and loving God. With this said, and without any statistical proof to, to present to you, there are those in the church today who would say this in different ways, but something like this, it is all, quote, it is not always good to know the truth. This kind of statement represents what some leaders like myself believe today are the silent and fearful, fearful majority in the church. Today, the Rayner mentions in his blog, the silent and fearful majority. This kind of thinking, my friends, first and foremost, is unbiblical. Secondly, it is characteristic of those who will let evil exist because they are afraid to confront it. But man, oh man, Paul wasn't. Paul said to Peter about his actions, verse 11, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Apostle Peter, a very important leader in the church, had joined, momentarily it seems, the silent and fearful majority of his day. He was, as Paul put it in verse 14, not in step with the truth of the gospel. And what was Peter thinking? Did he forget what God had revealed to him in a vision on top of the housetop in Acts 10? And the result of that, of him going to a Gentile by the name of Cornelius, and they all came to faith in Christ, and they all received the Holy Spirit, Gentiles, not circumcised. What was Peter thinking? But Paul understood the gravity of Peter's action. The gospel was intended for the, all the nations. The gospel, my friend, is beyond race and color and creed, beyond social standing, beyond economic standing, beyond status. Paul said to Peter, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews. Well, quickly, my friends, there's three things we need to take away from here. This came from one of my commentary readings, I think from John Stott's commentary on Galatians. We need to apprehend the gospel. We need to receive the gospel. And then we need to comprehend the gospel. We need to understand the gospel. And three, we need to apply the gospel into our lives and into the lives of everyone around us, in the church and beyond the walls of the church. You see, indeed, Peter had received the gospel. Yes, Peter understood the gospel, but here at this moment in time, he did not apply the gospel. He was causing disunity in the church between those Greeks in that day and the Jews in that day. And Paul would have none of it. And we should have none of it in our churches, and in our denominational arguments. The gospel is the very essence of what a Christian is and bees. It's the essence. We should be reminded of this and to stand on this when Paul said to the Galatians, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. I pray we take these words to heart each and every day of our lives. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your message to us today. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the freedom we have in Christ that we can extend our hand like Barnabas did to Paul and bring others into our community, even if they are messed up. And we can bring the light and the love of the gospel into their lives and, 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 and watch as they receive it, when they receive it, the transformation right before our eyes. Lord, help us to be strong and courageous and stand up against evil Help us to know without any doubt what the gospel is so that we can present it lovingly to others. 
that we would stand against evil, that we would stand against what you call sin, that we would stand with your definitions of mar- with your definition of marriage and 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 biology in a world that's lost its mind in that area. Oh, help us, Almighty Lord, to love others as you have loved us. That's the key. That's the key above all. Oh, Lord, give us solid, biblical teachers and preachers. And I pray for those who are in this world today, receiving the adulation of the world as they preach a gospel of Jesus plus, 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 and it's not confrontational. It doesn't even talk about sin. It's taking the cross off the wall, so to speak. It's about a better life now and fighting our Goliaths and all those things, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would bring them to their knees. And we pray for them, Lord, that they would repent, repent of their sin, that they would surrender and walk away from those ministries they created that was built on nothing but a bunch of cards. And if they don't, one day it would all fall down on them, and it has happened so often. And Lord, because of that, your name is besmirched in the world. The Holy Spirit is made to be some weird, I don't know, new age thing. Oh, Father, we pray for those. We love them, and I pray for them. For those who have been injured and abused spiritually by leaders in the church, oh God, protect them. Protect their hearts, heal them, bring them to a safe place, a safe church, a a church that loves them with all their strength, might. That loves them like Paul loved Peter and stood up and said, you are wrong, brother. You are wrong. (sighs) Paul did the most loving thing. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a good day. Shalom.